Groundhog pushed the red button. Oh! Greetings, Neuroloaders! My name is Rook, reporting to you live via AllSpark Radio Transmission from Mouth Zero Four Studios in Cybertron City. I have here five of Cybertron's greatest heroes, some plucked from distant planets, and others from dimensions yet to be fully explored. Speaking with me today are Autobots Trax and Cosmos. Salutations. Happy to be here. As well as Autobot Spy Changers, Ironhide, and Hotshot. Hey, how's it going? Hey there! <laughs> Hot the shotta! Transform! <laughs> <clears throat> Lastly, I have with me a human from the planet Earth named Michael McConaughey, who has astonishingly enough been able to download each of these Autobot heroes' voice tracks for uses of commercial enterprise and mimicry. Uh, right. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. All right, now these first set of questions are for Trax. Tell us, Trax, how would you deal with the following scenario? You're in a high-speed chase with a rogue Decepticon. During the chase, a canister of acid is tipped over, splashing onto your finish. You know that if you continue the chase, your finish will be ruined, but there is a drive through car wash only seconds away which could save you considerable damage but cause you to lose your pursuit. What do you do? Continue the hunt and let your paint job be destroyed, or save your paint job and let the con go. Well, it's about time, my dear fellow. But I see you want to play gotcha. All right, with your little scenario, we'll play. But first, let's dispel one misconception. I am not, I repeat, not vain. I have often said I have a highly developed sense of self-appreciation, but I am not without some objectivity. And understand, I did take an oath. In this case, achieve the objective and then run for the paint chamber. Good grief, man. Oh, my, my, I didn't realize that would be such a touchy subject. In your popular new alternator form, you are armed to the teeth, but you don't have your gorgeous trademark flames. They even wanted to make you yellow. Do you consider the extra weapons a suitable upgrade, or are you still fuming over the change to your paint job? Well, as far as that coloration is concerned, you can paint me blue, you can paint me yellow, I'm still going to be that excellent fellow. Well, let's face it, I make any color look good. It has been said that clothes make the man, but weaponry makes the bot. That may be true as far as it goes, but I dare say I could be just about as effective if I didn't have the extra arms. You see, the use of intelligence is a plus that Decepticons have never had. Now, to many of your fans' delight, your Generation 1 toy was recently reissued. Unlike many of your comrades who were reissued, your missiles did not have to be made longer. How do you feel about that? Do you like them long or short? Well, it's about time the classics were appreciated for what they are. But, oh, good heavens, this whole thing with the missiles? What's next? Cannon implants? Really? No, I don't care whether they're long or they're short because they are exactly the right size. I'm sure you've already heard this from that wankers fellow. It's not how big they are. It's what you do with them. Wait, can I say that on the Internet? Ah, uh, yes, this wankus fellow. Oh, we'll talk more about him later. Now, Trax, both you and Sunstreaker talk yourselves up to be the best-looking bots around. <laughs> I think you've got a little competition here. <laughs> okay, maybe not. Uh, the difference is you don't point out everyone else's flaws the way Sunstreaker does. If you were to point out his worst flaws, what would they be? In Transformer terms, he is very young. And the thing about youth is, you will grow out of it. In this cult of personality, someone is always trying to manufacture some sort of conflict between individuals. I mean, if you read it in the Transformer Tattler, it must be true. Sunstreaker is on the right side of things. He's a very fine bot. If you can't find anything nice to say about someone, you're not trying. For heaven's sake, find a friend who has something good to say. There's something good about everyone. Except for the Decepticons, of course. It goes without saying. Oh, I did say it. Yes, Trax, you did say that, and that's history in the making, folks. Thank you, Trax, for those insightful and colorful remarks. Let's turn our attentions now to Cosmos. Cosmos, in Megatron's master plan, you helped save the entire Autobot cast. 
As thanks, you were subsequently ignored for a very long time. How did this make you feel? You know, spending the time as I have out in the outer reaches of space, I have a lot of time to think. And among the things I've thought is, life really isn't very fair. And sometimes, no good deed goes unpunished. It's all right. I understand. It didn't make me feel very good. But you know, you learn to cope. You learn to see what's important. And taking care of our responsibilities is what was important to me. Yes, that's true. Life can be very unfair. But do you think the Autobots overlooked your potential as one of the few among their ranks who could actually fly? Well, you've got to remember, Trax too could also fly. Of course, he wasn't very good at the landing part. I don't think they were very jealous of me. But if they were, I'd kind of take it as a compliment. A compliment indeed. Now let's turn our attention back to Trax for one second. Cosmos mentioned your flying antics. Now, when you would land, would that scuff your finish? No comment, I see. All right, back to Cosmos. Cosmos, when you would hear your Autobot comrades complain about not being able to fly, did you ever ask them why they didn't just scan alt modes which could fly? Well, at the time, we weren't into all that scanning stuff. Pretty much, after we arrived, we sort of took our forms and that's what it was. And we were pretty happy with it. I don't think it pays to be nasty. You know, you're a nice bot, Cosmos. Tell me, if you were to be the next one up for an alternator upgrade, what would you be? You know, the human beings have a saying of being comfortable in your own skin. I've been sort of green and round and just the way I am for so long. I don't think I'd want to change at all. Call me an old-fashioned bot. That's just the way I am. Very interesting. Uh, now these next few questions are for the Autobot Spy Changers. Uh, these gentlemen will have to be off in a hurry since apparently there's some trouble with Mirage, so I'll only keep it to one question. First question for Hotshot. So, does it ever bother you that they took your name, gave it to another robot, and made him a focal point of the next two Transformers cartoons, <laughs> while totally forgetting you. Well, let's face it, it really is a hot name. I mean, who wouldn't want to be called Hotshot? But I gotta admit, it does kind of gravel me. I mean, I had a good thing going. I had a proven, if somewhat short, track record. But, hey, what are you gonna do? That's the bot biz. <laughs> and boy, don't I know it. This next question is for Ironhide. <clears throat> Do you ever get any flack for ripping off, or, I mean, borrowing your name from such an iconic Generation 1 Transformer? Hey, you know, we got our traditions, and there's all kinds of things you could do. Now, Ironhide, the first, I gotta tell you, if I were gonna take after somebody, <laughs> I could have made a much worse choice. And I mean, let's face it, it's not like we pick our own names. If I did, <laughs> you know, I'd be like Bull Boy or Horn Dog or something like that. Something a little more, uh, evocative, if you know what I mean. Yeah, of course. And I apologize for the horrible impression I just did of the original Ironhide, uh, Horn Boy. <laughs> and now we move on to our special friend from the planet Earth, uh, Michael McConaughey. He's so small and cute and lovable. Who's your boo-boo doo-doo? Is it you? I'm sorry, I, I get that way around smaller creatures. Who's got your nose? I got your nose! <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. On to the first question. Being the lone link between the Generation 1 cartoon and Robots in Disguise, tell us a little about how the two experiences were alike and how they were different. Well, it's really interesting. Such a bizarre position to be in as the not-so-missing link. Now, in Transformers, we had a bunch of guys, a bunch of damn good actors in the same room. We got to work off each other, pick up each other's timing. If there were an idea for a flow to go one way, we could all kind of follow and adjust. When we're doing the dubbed versions, there is only one actor in the booth at a time. The constraints are severe. The animation is what it is, the script is what it is, and there's very, very little room for any kind of flex. You're locked into the picture, you're locked into what the words are, because that's what has to fit the mouths. At least for the bots that have mouths. Now, Michael, it's been rumored that you've had some work done. Is that true? Oh, <laughs> wrong card. Let me just put that to the bottom of the pile. Uh, 
Michael, many people speculate your voice for Cosmos was based off of radio legend Peter Lorre. Is this true? And if so, why did you pick that voice? Cosmos. My poor problem child never gets any respect. The Rodney Dangerfield of Autobots. Yes, he is based on Peter Lorre. Wally Burr had an idea uh, for the voice and said, you know, try this when I came in for the auditions. And we noodled around a little bit and decided, yeah, that's going to work because nobody else is doing that. And that's sort of how we arrived at the persona for Cosmos, this large, ungainly, lumbering fellow who is not without sensitivity, mind you, but never seems to be really taken into the arms of his comrades, which is really not fair. No wonder he enjoyed being worshipped in a god gambit. Okay, he was a little uncomfortable at first, but, you know, as gods go, he was pretty good. Now we've all heard the cliché, but what I really want to do is direct! After co-directing Robots in Disguise, do you still really want to direct, and what new insights did your directing experience give you into voice acting? I've actually got a t-shirt at home that says, what I really don't want to do is direct. That really was never my intention. Way back in the late 80s when I started working, and I would be on a script in some acquired animation, and I would say, I could do a better script than this. And they said, okay, do it. So then I found myself being uh, an ADR adapter. Okay, fine, good enough. And then I'd be in a studio working on a script I had written, and the director wasn't quite grokking what was going on. And I said, you know, I could direct better than that. And they said, okay, do it. So basically, I opened my mouth and stuck my own foot in it and pulled out a directing career. I have done a lot of other things as well, uh, a lot of uh, games and so forth, including a couple of CD-ROMs where I was directing the original cast of Star Trek. And if you don't think it's a daunting thing, Bill Shatner to Leonard Nimoy and back again, you don't have a pulse. And the one thing I have learned from the directing, which directly impacts the voice acting, communication. I now have a much better facility with being able to communicate what something is and how it can be changed without actually giving a line reading. Actors hate that. It's very interesting to see how you've used those past experiences to your advantage. Us Transformers, well, most of us, uh, we have those qualities already pre-programmed, so not something I would necessarily worry about. Were you surprised by the fandom which has formed around the Transformers when you came to the 2002 BotCon convention? Uh, you've been to a few others. Surprised? Floored. Flabbergasted is more like it. I have met new friends at these conventions that I never knew I had. Grown-up human beings with babies. People who brought their kids to meet us because we were such a special part of their lives. I mean, no pressure there. Tell us, how much time did you get to spend working with Wankus on Robots in Disguise? Are there any fun stories to tell about such a unique person? <laughs> Wankus, 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 Wankus. Mm-hmm. He's actually a very nice guy, and rather quiet and unassuming. And there are plenty of stories, none of which I will go into here. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank my guests for taking the time to speak with us here on the AllSpark Radio Frequency. Sure, happy to be here. My great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being had. <laughs> no problem. I would also like to thank our technical staff, uh, Human Daniel Ross for hair, 1DB for makeup, Wheelamus for props, Calidor for lights, sorry to our guests for the darkness, Newsy891 and Quantum Hawk for editing. Prowl for catering, those Energon-laced muffins were spectacular, Taganaga for sound design, and finally we have to thank Defunct for keeping the latrine so sparkling clean. We couldn't do it without you, little buddy. History does always favor the victor at the expense of truth, but we here at this program are trying to change all that. For everyone here at the AllSpark Radio Frequency, this is Rook, signing off.